Hey everyone, here today to talk about feudal Japan. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I want you to look at is our essential questions for today. So after today, and all the activities we're going to do, you should be able to compare and contrast European feudalism and Japanese feudalism. You should be able to discuss the Japanese honor code of Bushido. And you should be able to answer the question, would you prefer the chivalry or Bushido? And also know what the concept of seppuku is. So let's go ahead and get started. So basically, we know we have feudalism going on in Europe. We talked a little bit about that. Cool thing is, same thing is happening in Japan. One big difference, though. Feudalism in Japan lasts all the way until the 1800s. And so basically, like when America is fighting the Civil War in the 1860s, there are still samurai in Japan. Whereas, obviously, in Europe, uh, the knights aren't around in the 1800s. So the cool thing about the Japanese is we actually have pictures of feudal Japan. So I'm going to show you some of those today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I want to mention is social structure. Okay, Social structure is very important to understanding any feudal society. Okay, so here's the deal. It's very similar to Europe, okay, in that there is a there's a figurehead on top. There is a there is an emperor who has uh, um, not too much power, kind of like the the king in Europe. The king in Europe is uh, is is not very powerful. Um, the, po the real power in Japan is with the military leaders. Okay, and the hardcore supreme military leader of Japan is known as the shogun. Okay, and then below the shogun, you have very wealthy warriors that own a lot of land. They are called daimyos. All right, and then below them, you have the warrior class, the master warriors, and that is the samurai, very comparable to the knights. So once again, you're seeing a lot of similarities here between, hopefully, Europe and Japan. The daimyos are like the wealthy landowners, lords in Europe. Samurai, very much like the, um, obviously, the, the knights in Europe. Below the samurai are the peasants and the farmers. Uh, the peasants and the farmers were actually some of the most, were probably the poorest people um, in all of Japan, yet they were looked at uh, in a very good light. They were, they were looked at as being um, a very honorable, noble profession, even though they weren't very treated very nicely. And ironically enough, the people at the lower end, the artisans, so the people that made swords, the people that made uh, the, some of these trades people, um, those people and the merchants, who were some of the more wealthy people, were actually uh, at the lower end of the social structures. Like merchants were like the most wealthy, uh, but they were scoffed at. They were looked at as kind of the scum of society. So kind of intriguing, I suppose. All right. So here's some pictures that are going to help us kind of understand. Uh, top of the social ladder is the emperor. Not a lot of real power. Um, basically, the emperors back then gave all the power to the um, powerful shogun. Okay. Um, so just like in Europe, uh, Japan's central government is pretty weak. Okay. Uh, and really, the power is held by those local warlords, those uh, those daimyo. Okay. Now, one key difference between Europe and Japan is that in Europe, uh, if you wanted someone to be loyal to you, you would have to give them land. But in Japan, there's not a lot of land, and so typically, what wealthy daimyo would do is they would give samurai food to serve, and that is, you know, how it worked because Japan is not a lot of land. Only the greatest samurai receive land for service. Okay. So here's some pictures here. Here's uh, some uh, examples of Japanese architecture and art and stuff like that. There's a, um, it shows you the shogun's room and how the shogun would have sat. So very disciplined way of sitting, very appropriate. The Japanese also built castles like the Europeans did to protect their land. Um, the daimyos constantly fought one another for more land, just like the in Europe, the lords would fight one another. Okay, so there's a picture of a Japanese castle. So obviously there's some pretty big architectural differences between the two. Um, so here's an actual picture of a samurai that kind of looks like the dude from Spaceballs, but uh, that is an actual samurai. The samurai were only focused on war, just like the knights in Europe, okay? So the samurai constantly trained for war. Uh, they were master swordsmen, they were master horsemen, they were master bowmen. One key difference between the knights and the samurai is that the samurai are going to be uh, a, a lot more lightly armored. They're not going to have these big metal plates and chain mail that the European knights had. Uh, they're going to rely on more leather, um, you know, heavier cloth than the knights would. So that means the, the samurai would be much, much faster uh, than the knights would have been. Also, a big key difference is that the, uh, uh, the samurai really put a lot of emphasis in the bow, whereas the knights, not so much. 
Um, so here's some pictures. This, these are pictures from the last Samurai, the movie with Tom Cruise, and it just gives us a good idea of um, you know what Samurai might have looked like, how they train. So you can see uh, two people training with wooden swords. Um, once again, another picture of uh, from the movie Last Samurai. You can see what they look like. Obviously, very, um, you know, very beautifully decorated, um, very intimidating looking. Um, sorry for all the beeps going off here. Um, and here we see some other important information here. Um, basically, the samurai had such a high status in Japan that when they walked down the street, and if any, if if someone didn't bow to them, you could literally kill them. So if you were a samurai and someone did not bow to you, uh, you could kill them. So if you look at the crowds here, uh, you can see that people are bowing to the samurai. Here's another picture of an actual samurai. See the two swords. There's a long sword and a short sword. More pictures of actual samurai. Here you can see the bow. You can see just how big it is. Other samurai and their weapons. Here's a here's an example of, of what a samurai would look like today. So here's a, a dude that kind of basically made his own samurai outfit. Another picture of a uh, a real samurai. So this is a real samurai. You can see all the impressive uh, body armor that they wore. Pretty cool stuff. All right. Uh, here's some other cool things about samurai. Uh, when samurai would fight, uh, they would basically call their family's name and their accomplishments. And they would attempt to find a samurai of similar skill. And so basically battles back then were these massive one-on-ones. Uh, I mean, if you defeated a samurai, you would cut off their head as a way to, uh, um, to basically prove your skill. So if I was a samurai, I'd be like, I'm Kevin Hyde, clan of Hyde. You know, and I would list off all my family's accomplishments. And I would try to, I would try to find a warrior who was equal to me, which probably wouldn't be very difficult. Um, Samurai were also very interesting folks. They were uh, they were very disciplined. Um, they very much appreciated beauty, um, and they were very similar to the Spartans in the fact that they also were searching kind of for that beautiful death. the uh, The ideal death for a samurai was not to live to old age, but to uh, to die gloriously in battle um, to a worthy opponent. So kind of interesting stuff. Now here's something I think is very important, and this is the honor code of the samurai. And so the knights in Europe have chivalry. Uh, the samurai in Japan have Bushido, and Bushido means the way of the warrior. Okay, so samurai, just like their European counterparts, were supposed to be courageous, honorable, and loyal, and they were to live a life of extreme focus. Okay, so a samurai's life was one of discipline. Okay, and focusing on honing their craft of warfare and becoming the best warriors they could be, and to be disciplined. They would do things that required a lot of discipline. They would write poetry, some of the most beautiful works of, of, uh, of literature and poetry from Japan during this period come from samurai. Uh, they would keep beautiful gardens, and they would have these incredibly elaborate tea parties that had all these you know, rules and um, you know, certain ways of doing things. Okay? The cool thing about the samurai that makes them very much different than the knights is that defeat or any kind of dishonor was very unacceptable to the to the Japanese samurai. Okay, and if you were a samurai and you were defeated or you were shamed in battle, it was expected of you to commit seppuku. Okay, and seppuku is basically ritual suicide. And if you look at the picture over here on the right, what we're seeing this guy doing here is he's sitting down and he's taking a knife right here. He's got his knife and he's going to jab it into his stomach. Okay, and once he jabs it into his stomach, he's going to wrench it all the way up to his, to basically his breastplate, and he's going to basically disembowel himself, and so all of his guts would spill out, and then he's going to sit there um, and take the pain. Okay, and by committing this horrendous suicide, this horrible way to die, which is incredibly painful and could take a very long time, the samurai is showing that they are indeed um, someone who cares about their honor. Um, they're showing they're brave by killing themselves in this horrendous way, and by doing this, they're hopefully regaining their honor and getting rid of all their shame. Okay, so an incredibly painful way to die, and a very common practice. And you still see this kind of attitude towards suicide in Japan all the way into the 20th century. Okay, for instance, if you think about all the kamikazes, the planes um, that would have basically suicide bombers on them that would fly into the American Navy ships. So this idea of seppuku. Um, of honorable suicide 
um, is still around in Asia for the most part today. All right, so here's some more pictures of uh, of seppuku. Okay, so you can see the knife that one would uh, the one would use. Here you can see someone here. You just wrote some poetry, um, and he's meditating before he does it. Here's another one, a uh, picture of someone committing seppuku. Um, oftentimes, uh, here's a kind of a weird, freaky picture. Uh, many times when you would commit seppuku, what they would do is they would uh, they would uh, stab themselves um, in the stomach. And basically then they would sit there and take the pain for a couple moments. It would be incredibly painful. And then they would give a sign, maybe it's just like sticking their neck out. And they would have a friend um, who would then chop off their head, okay, to make sure that it wasn't too painful. Okay, so anyways, pretty interesting stuff. So we're going to stop there for today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, mini lecture here.